Welcome back, everyone, to the 39th episode of the Tundra Cast. And today we got myself, we got Nick, we got Rossi, and we got Jake. And we got a huge special guest today. He's a former Montreal Canadian, Vancouver Canucks, Philadelphia Flyer, you name it. Um, currently playing Sweden right now, but that's that, that's Dale Weiss. Yeah, well, first off, uh, I just kind of wanted to ask, why did you choose I.K. Oscar Schaum? Was there something that kind of led you to that decision? Or? Yeah, uh, I've actually got asked that one a lot. People are like, uh, how did you end up there? Um, yeah. Obviously, a team that, that doesn't have a really big rep here uh, in Sweden. But um, you know what? I talked to a lot of Russian teams. Uh, I, I, I told the story in a couple other podcasts that I did. I had a deal last year in Switzerland uh, after the bubble with Montreal. And I literally just was in the bubble for two months. I wasn't around my family. I had my twins were still really young. Uh, COVID was going crazy. Nobody knew what was going on. So I came home after not seeing my family for two months. And I was like, ah, I really don't want to leave my family for eight months in a wild time. So I turned on the Switzerland offer. And now it was kind of like when I went to contact teams this year, that was like really where I wanted to go. Switzerland was going to be my first option. And the teams there were like, ah, you're not committed to hockey. I don't think you'll actually come or you'll come play two weeks. You'll get a sign your bonus and then you'll bail on us. So I had to come over and prove myself a little bit. So I started looking at Sweden. Um, I talked to the coach and the GM here, and we were kind of on the same page. A couple of the other teams I talked to, um, you know, when I was like, well, what, what do you think of me as a player? And teams are like, wow, you know, you, you played a role during the NHL. That's where I see you over here. And I was like, okay, hold on a second here. Like, I'm not, I'm not coming over to Sweden to play on the fourth line. I'm sorry. Um, no, no disrespect to you guys and, and no disrespect. It's a good league. Um, but anybody that's on a fourth line in the NHL is a, a an elite player in, in these leagues over here. So uh, I, I just felt like the coach and the GM and me were on the same page. And, uh, and then, you know, I, at that point, I didn't really care what the city was like, um, you know, wh where I had to go. I just knew that we were on the same page and that was going to help me, um, you know, get off to a good start in Europe. And, and uh, you know, I plan to play a couple of years over here. So I wanted to get off to a good start in a spot that believed in me. For sure. Any insights to what the hockey culture is like there in Sweden compared to here? Is there like a bit of a language barrier or any culture differences there? Yeah, I think the only difference I would say in the way they play is very interesting. Um, you know, they, they play a, a, a style that I really didn't expect. Like you come on the big ice, you expect it to be wide open and, and lots of skating and, and spread out and offensive. But uh, it's really not in this league. It's really different from Russia and Switzerland where, you know, if you watch the highlights of those leagues, like there's some some really nice high-end plays and it's wide open and free-flowing. Sweden is very, very structured. Um, everything's real tight. They don't use the width of the ice a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of like clutching and grabbing. It's, it's the roughing's a, a, a little bit, um, um, I don't know what the right word is, but they're just, it's not good. It's not good. I will, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But, um, the, the language bear has been great. Like everybody speaks English on the team. Um, everything the coach says is in English. So it's been a really easy transition that way. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about that. I think it'd be a different story if you're in Russia where you can't talk to anybody, the coach doesn't speak in English. That would kind of get lonely after a little while, I think. Did COVID make that transition hard? Because, I mean, you're coming from North America to Sweden. You know, there's a 14-day quarantine, I think. Like, was it hard to, you know, move to a different country? Yeah, so this is the craziest thing. So, you know, in Manitoba, where I, I've been living for the lot, you know, since COVID started when the NHL shut down and, and, and that's where my family's been, you know, like we've had the, the highest restrictions out of like anywhere in Canada. Like literally you're, you're wearing masks everywhere. There was like everything shut down. Um, it's been literally complete lockdowns for two years there. So, you know, when I got here, there's no such thing as a mask. They never wore a mask the whole time since COVID started. Um, you know, there's no limits. There's no nothing. Like it's literally like life is back to normal here. So that's kind of been awesome uh, to be honest with you. As soon as I got here, there's like no such thing as COVID. It's like it doesn't even exist here. <laughs> right. Um, and what made you start Habs tonight? Because, you know, you're running your own podcast with other Habs fans. What made you start that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for the longest time that I played in the NHL, I, I, I couldn't watch hockey. Um, I don't know what it was. It was like... A, I couldn't stand the announcers. That was probably most of it. I couldn't yeah. stand the way they yeah. talked. I couldn't stand their like bullshit stories where they're like, you know, talking behind the scenes and they the guy said this and it's like, really, you didn't even talk to the guy. You clearly just made that up. Uh, so there's so much <laughs> of that, that. There's so much of that, man. That just really, really pissed me off. So 
um, for that, I kind of wanted to give a different insight. Um, and, and I wanted to be honest, you know, and, and I wanted to shed some light on the fact that, you know, NHL guys that are in the NHL will not give interviews and tell people exactly what's going on. They will not tell you the truth. It's so cliche. And I think that's where the, like, you know, like where people are so branded of hockey players where it's so like generic, it's, you know, 60 minutes, play hard, shoot the puck, dump and chase. Like there's just no personality to hockey. And, and I wanted to like have some interviews where you could talk to guys and see them come out of their shell a little bit. And, um, you know, just, just kind of be a real person where there's so many good characters in hockey. Every single hockey player I've ever played with is like hilarious and funny. And just, you know, when you get them away, when people can't see and it's private, like they're just such entertaining people. And I don't think the NHL does a good enough job of like selling guys and showing the fans that. And, and, and right. um, for me, I just wanted to show a different side of it. And uh, obviously being a huge Habs fan since I grew up and then playing on the team, I had, had some, some good connections with current players. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to do that. Um, a bit of a question I have is uh, during the NHL's 2012-2013 lockout, it was a pretty weird time for you know for fans, and um, I want to ask uh, for you as a player, how, what was it like to describe your transition from the NHL to the Dutch league during that lockout? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, you know, I went to I was such a young guy. I literally played one year in the NHL. I. I finally solidified myself. I signed a one way. I really wasn't paying attention to anything. I was like, there's no way there's a lockout. I, I paid attention to nothing. I knew nothing about the lockout. I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. Come on. There's no way. Like you just had a lockout like seven years ago. Like there's, there's no way this is happening again. So I went to Vancouver. I was there for about a three weeks training. You know, there's probably like four or five guys there. And I was like, holy shit. Like this is, I think this is actually going to happen. Like we're not going to play. So I left. I went home back to Winnipeg and there wasn't many guys in Winnipeg training. So, you know, you're looking like end of September, I'm not skating a lot, October, and I'm like, oh, if, if they get things going here, like I haven't skated, I got to go play a little bit. I'm 23 years old. So I literally called my agent. I was like, hey, sign me anywhere. I really don't care. I just want to go anywhere. And, and literally he called me back in like two hours. Like I got a spot in Amsterdam. I was like, do you have a league there? Are you serious? He's like, yeah. yeah. So I'm in. I'm in. Let's go. And uh and I went there and it was awesome, man. Like they treated me so well. The fan base is incredible. Um, my wife now was my girlfriend at the time. Like we had so much fun there. It was fun where, you know, the past three years you're playing pro, like it's serious. You're trying to get to the NHL. Um, and then there you could just go back to having fun. You're just playing hockey. There's no pressure. Uh, so that was, that was really, really cool. And that's where your nickname, the Dutch Gretzky came from, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Do you still go by that nickname or do you just, do you just despise it? Um, I, I did despise it at first uh, because Vancouver was like chirping me about it. Um, like in the news when I was ripping it up over there, they're like writing like these like negative articles and like, you know, like, oh, he's the Dutch Gretzky over there and he's terrible over here and like just kind of junk. So I hated it. Um, and then when I went to Montreal, they actually kind of used it as a positive. So I, I was, I, I enjoyed it once I got to Montreal. At first I hated it, but um you know, Montreal used it as like a good way. They're like, man, this guy can play. Like, you know, he ripped it up in Holland, whatever it is. But uh, they turned it into a positive. So I enjoyed it from there on. Um, let's um, date back to like the start of your career. How was your draft experience like along with your first NHL game? Yeah, so I got drafted as a 19 in junior, which is pretty rare. Uh, I got passed over at 17. I got passed over at 18. Um, I didn't even have like uh training camp offers you know guys get like a uh, amateur tryouts or whatever i didn't even have any offers which is crazy to me at 18 i really thought i was going to get drafted at a good year um our team wasn't very good i let our team in scoring um and still no offer so that kind of just added a chip to my shoulder and then when i came back in my 19 year old year i got off to a good start and then teams started to reach out to me um so i kind of knew at that point like okay like you know i i i've, I've worked I'm, I'm earning it and then throughout the year, I started to talk to more teams, so I kind of expected it to happen. Um, I kind of expected to go in the third, fourth round. So we, I was at home with my mom and dad watching. It was, it was uh, you know, standard. Friday night has the first round. And then I saw, you know, the Islanders is who I thought was going to pick me originally. Uh, I, I literally talked to them a ton before the draft. And, and you know, in the first round, they made a couple of trades. They literally had like six picks in the third round. I was like, okay, the Islanders are going to take me in the third round for sure. Um, and the next day, I was just watching my mom and dad. Third round goes by. I didn't get picked. I was like, okay, you start to get a little nervous. I'm like, it's, this is going to happen here. It's going to happen. Um, and then it was, it was, you know, 
uh, in 2008, they had it on like uh, NHL on the fly, but it wasn't like they didn't really show you like the announcers were talking. So you could you couldn't really hear names in the background. And then they'd show the board every now and then. So I thought I kind of heard my name and I was like, oh, fuck, it could have been anything. Um, but then, you know, I get a call right away and the Rangers call me. They're like, hey, we just drafted you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, you got to get on a plane and come here tomorrow. So that was that was a cool feeling, man, to be there with my mom and dad. Um, you know, two people that have supported me all the way. They're my, my biggest supporters um, and, you know, all the hard work that they put in and, and, and all those, you know, the standard cliche, like early mornings and driving me everywhere and doing all this for me was uh, was cool to share that with them. And then uh, it took me a couple of years to play my first game. Um, you know, I got called up a couple of times in my second pro year and didn't get a chance to play. I warmed up game time decision. Guy decides to play. It literally happened to me like seven times. I was so choked. Every single time, like, okay, you're called up. You're going to play this time for sure. And I'm watching the guy warm up. I was like, this guy looks fine. Why am I even here? Sure enough, he plays, boom, <laughs> you know, we say you're not playing, go back down. Two weeks later, another guy gets hurt, come up, boom, not play. So it's brutal. Uh, but when I actually got a chance to play, I knew I was playing the day before. They said, someone's hurt. Uh, they don't have any extra bodies. You're going to play tomorrow in Philly. Uh, I was in Hartford at the time. I flew from Hartford to Philly. It was a, a one o'clock game on a Saturday. So uh, I didn't have all day to think about it. Uh, that was probably the best part. Literally, you got up, ate breakfast. I went to the rink, and um, and that was just a incredible game for me. It was something I'll never forget. Uh, on uh, October 30th, 2015, you actually scored your first career hat trick against the Flames in a 6-2 victory. How was that experience like? That was awesome, man. Um, I, I got off to a really good start that year. That was that was that was a fun year for me. Um, I had really good line mates. Uh, Thomas Fleischman, David Darnay were awesome. I loved playing with them. Probably the the two uh, best line mates that I had a chance to play with in my career. Um, so that was a cool game, man. I had the first one early in the game. Uh, I had the second one in the second period. And then I was like, you know, I, I, I've had a couple of two goal games before that, but I, you know, I scored the second goal, like you know, late in the third period. I never really had a real good chance to take a run at it. Um, but, it, you know, I didn't really think about it a lot. And then, um, you know, it's funny, actually, Fleischman lost the puck on it. It makes it like, you know, if you watch the replay, it looks like he made a sick play. And again, the announcer's like, what a vision, what a drop pass. But really, <laughs> he just lost the puck. He was trying to go to his back and lost the puck. So, uh, you know, that was cool, man. That's something I'll never forget. I got a pretty cool plaque from Montreal, you know, um, to say he scored a hat trick in the NHL. You know, everybody that ever watched me growing up or um, all the people that said, you know, I'd never make it in junior, I'd never make it in the NHL. That's just something, uh, it's something pretty cool to have in your hat. And uh, I'm pretty proud of that. And what was your just favorite market to play in? I mean, I, I think I can assume it's Montreal. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, what was, what was the best part about playing in Montreal? Yeah, you got that one right. Montreal to me um, was the best just for a lot of reasons. I think growing up as a Canadian kid, um, you know, I got a chance to play in Vancouver, which was great. We had really good teams there. Um, but Vancouver is just not Montreal's hockey market. It's just not, you know, you just can't compare it. Um, you know, you're just treated like a god in that city. Everywhere you go, everybody appreciates you, regardless if you're a, you know, top scorer, you're a fourth line guy, you're a grinder, whatever it is. They just appreciate everybody. And, um, and that kind of just gives you a boost, man. It makes you want to play harder and, and, and play for the city. And um, it's just, there's, there's just the team too, you know, every NHL team treats the players incredible and you have, you know, you have the best of the trainers and the best buildings and, and, you know, and so on. But uh, Montreal just goes the extra mile to, to just make sure you're comfortable, your family's comfortable. You have every advantage to be a good player um, and, and, Man, it was just nothing like playing a game on a Saturday night going to the Bell Center. You know, as I said, I, I grew up a Montreal Canadiens fan. I was watching games with my brother and dad every Saturday. And when you get a chance, like every Saturday, man, I get chills just thinking about it right now. Like you just, those are the moments you want to play hockey. You know, you're walking in the rink, you got your sex suit on, you know, all the boys are at the bar back home watching you. And uh, it's just, man, there's not a better feeling. Did you get nosed easily in Montreal compared to places like Philly? Um, yeah, yeah. Montreal is just crazy, man. Like there's times and then, and I had like really dark tint on my window. So you, you really couldn't see in and there would be people like pulling up beside me and waving and shit. And I'm like, how do you even see me? <laughs> how do you see this? Uh, but Montreal was, was so respectful, man. Like, uh, I, I could be out for dinner with my family and, and it's not like people are rushing up to you and asking for autographs. Not that that would be a big deal or anything, but, uh, they're, they're really respectful and, 
um i don't know man i i was always one of those guys that really enjoyed it like for someone to come up to you and and uh just recognize you and, and appreciate your game man that just makes you i know for me uh it, it just made me want to play harder and, and do so well for them so being traded from montreal or chicago what was that like that was horrible horrible man um I really, really didn't want to get traded. Um, I did everything I could to push Bergevin to sign me. Um, you know, it wasn't like I was going in his office and knocking on it, but I'm, you know, hounding my agent like, come on, come on, let's get a deal. Let's get a deal here. Uh, and and an offer just never came. And a couple of days before I got traded, I thought we had a deal. My agent calls me after a game in Washington. He's like, hey, uh, I, I, I think we got a deal. And I was ecstatic. Because it was, we had no contact from there. I was trying to get a deal done from the year before. No offer, no offer, no offer. I call my agent after the game. Hey, what's going on? He's like, I think we got a three-year deal. Um, I'm just waiting on Burst to get back on specific. So it was like, done deal. I'm like, man, this is incredible. I'm so pumped. And then, you know, that was like a know, Thursday or Friday. We had the next day off, practice on a Saturday. And we were getting set to play on Sunday afternoon, I believe. And, you know, I messaged my agent Saturday. I was like, what's going on, man? It's two days. Like, do we have a deal? We don't like, it doesn't take that long. It takes 20 minutes for you to say, okay, done. Send the contract over. Uh, he's like, I don't know what to tell you. Like he's not returning my call. So it was kind of fishy at that point. And I mean, I was, I was having a really good year. I was on a cheap salary. I kind of knew it was, it was, it was an option. Um, and, and we were struggling, obviously we, were, we weren't going to make the playoffs. So then that night I was literally going to bed and my phone rings at like midnight. Um, and I never leave the volume on, but like, you know, I thought I was signing a deal. So I left my volume on and it's a random five, one, four number. And I knew I was traded right away. I pick up the phone. Burge was like, Hey, we, uh, we traded you to Chicago. Uh, you know, but I'd love for you to come back, uh, free agency. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a great <laughs> idea right now, man. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, how do you say that right now? So then uh, Stan Bowman called me and stuff, man. I, I was crushed. Though. I was shattered, man. I, uh, I I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay in Montreal. I never wanted to leave. Uh, so that was that was tough for me, man. It, it was even, you know, going to Chicago, it just never – it never felt right when I was there. Even in Philly, it didn't feel right. <laughs> right. So what was it like playing under Michelle Therrien and Joe Quenville? Uh, I, I love Michelle Therrien, man. Um you know, he was he was the best coach that I had. Um, what I loved about him is it was fair. It was fair. Like, if you were awful, he'd bring me in the, in the office and he'd tell me, he'd say, you're awful. You're awful. I should take you out of the lineup right now. You're you're terrible. Uh, I knew he's not going to take me out of the lineup, but he's like, you're, you're terrible. You're terrible. You, you got to better play better today or I'm taking you out. I said, okay. And then, you know, it obviously worked a lot of the times. Um, but he was the f- When struggling, boom, he moved me up the line and played with this guy, played with that guy. Um, and then I thought he had a really good eye. He was the best coach that I played for. And, I, man, I played for Vino and, and, you know, Joel Quenville. Like, I played for some really good coaches. And he was the best guy in game that would make those adjustments. I don't feel like enough NHL coaches do that. Where this guy's going, you know, get him out there a little more, play him a little more, switch the lines up. Like, guys are so afraid to do that. Um, and I think that's something he did really well. Joel Quenville, for me, it was, it was tough, man. Like, I went there – and he's like, I don't know a lot about you, um, so I'm going to try to figure you out. And I was like, what the – what are you talking about? <laughs> I've, been I've been in the league for like you know six years at this point. You just traded for me. Like, what do you mean you don't know anything about me? So I was like scratched the first couple of games I got traded there. Like, And I had uh, 14 goals at that point in like 45 games. I was on pace for well over 20, and he didn't know a lot about me. <laughs> I was so taken back by that. Um and then I, I I didn't play a lot when I was there. I scratched the first like four games in the playoffs. So I I, mean, I think he's a great coach. From what I saw, I thought it was great. Obviously, he's had a ton of success in Chicago, um, ton of success in Florida already. So I think he's a great coach. Um, just personally for me, man, it wasn't the wasn't the best experience. Um, a lot of fans wonder and talk about how this process is like. How was like the free agency process like as a player? Yeah, it was it was cool, man, because that was the first and and pretty much like only chance um, that I had to be an unrestricted free agent, and and you hold all the cards, you call all the shots. Um, it was awesome, man. You you have ten teams calling, telling you how awesome you were, which is which is awesome because the previous you know 
six years I've been in the league, you're grinding to get, you know, a one way deal. And they're like, well, I don't think you're very good. And it's, this is a team you played on, you know, and then they just do it as a, as, as a contract thing. So it's nice to finally be in a position where teams are calling and they want you. Um, and then you can kind of pick and try to find, find the best fit for you. Uh, so that was cool, man. That, that was really cool. I really enjoyed it. And then, you know, we probably about three days before July 1st, Philly made their like substantial offer at three years. We said, I, okay, I want four. And then we kind of negotiated on that day. And then I knew, you know, probably two days before July 1st opened that I had that deal. And then, um, Montreal came back in late. They're like, Hey, do you want to take a hometown discount? And I was like, sorry, bud. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do yeah. that. Not after what you did to me. So no, thanks. Winnipeg was doing the same thing too. And I always wanted a chance to play in Winnipeg. But, uh, you know, their offer was substantially less in Philly, so I couldn't take that one. Uh, you mentioned before that, you know, you were sometimes scratching in Chicago. Did you feel like that, like, being in the fourth line in Chicago was going to, like, hurt your value? Huge, huge. I was, um, I was really concerned with that, to be honest with you. Um, I, 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 again, I didn't want to leave Montreal, but, again, I was in a really good situation there. I was playing a ton. I liked my line. I was on the second power play unit. I was in a really good situation to finish that year strong and cash in on, on the best year of my career. So I was, I was choked, man, when I went over there and you know, you're on pace to score 20 goals and then you're not even in the lineup that first game you get there. So it's, it, it was really frustrating, man. And, um, you know, then we get to the playoffs. You're like, okay, well we, you know, it's a good team. We can, we can go, go a long way here. You win a Stanley cup, you go deep in the playoffs, you play well, um, you know, you're going to get paid, but, uh, we ended up losing the first round. I came, I came in game five. I scratched the first four. I came in game five. I scored the winner, standard. And uh, then the coach is all pumped up. He's like, "Man, now I know what you, you know. I know what I know what you can do now." And it's like, "Well, it took you two and a half months, man. Thanks for giving me the chance. Like, maybe you should listen <laughs> to your GM when you traded for me." But uh, and then and then he apologized after the season. You know, he's like. Uh, even the GM apologized. Stan Bowman's like, I apologize. Like, I'm I'm sure I cost you a lot of money, and uh, I bring in the playoffs uh, players. Sorry, and and uh, the coach coaches them. So there's not much I can do. So I just want to apologize for that, which I thought was pretty respectful. Um, didn't help the fact that he cost me a couple million dollars, but that's uh, that's that's not here now. I'm over it now. But uh, I, I was deaf. I was frustrated at the time, man, because all of a sudden you, you, I've worked my whole career to to establish myself as is more than a fourth line grinder. And I have, you know, I'm in a position to do that. And then you got some teams where they're like, wow, you didn't play very well in Chicago. It's like, yeah, I didn't play well. What are you talking? I was playing six minutes a night. What do you want me to do with six <laughs> minutes a night, man? Play every, you know, 10 minutes. So that was, that was, that was frustrating for sure. Uh, earlier in the podcast, you mentioned how all of your teammates were, were like funny. And I want to ask, do you still keep in touch with any of your former teammates? Yeah, I talked to I talked to quite a bit, quite a bit of the guys. Um, you know, the guy that I talked to the most is probably PK Subban. Still, we uh, we we just had a ton of fun playing together. He was he was just one of those guys that uh, that I think is really really misunderstood by a lot of people if you don't know him. And um, it's just funny, man. I love chirping guys too. Like uh, I still talk to a lot of guys that are on the Habs and stuff, just joking around. And uh, you know, I talked to Galley a little bit from time to time. We were pretty close when we played there, so. Uh, you know, just some, some jokes about, uh, you know, whatever it is and, and, and this and that. So, I mean, it, you're the hockey guys that you play with, man, are, are your best friends for life. So you just, you never really lose those relationships. And uh, out of your teammates, who would you say is the funniest teammate you ever had? Funniest teammate I ever had? Uh, man, I got to go with Kevin Bieksa. Like, he, he was hilarious to play with. Um, just a really, really funny guy. Great character, man. He was always pranking guys. Uh, always kept everybody on their toes. So he's he was really, really funny. He's been a really good addition to that Sportsnet uh, panel too. Unreal, he's right? He's so good, man. He's so yeah. good on there. I, he's one of the guys that I, I totally respect on there. Uh, is there still any resentment toward Chris Kreider after that whole price incident there? And what was kind of going through players' minds when something like that occurs? Yeah, that was, uh, man, that's, I don't have a lot of regrets in life. I don't, uh, I'm not a guy that kind of likes to look, looks back and, and dwells on things, but that's one of those times, man, where 
I truly believe we would have won the Stanley Cup if, if Pricey didn't get hurt there. Just the way he was playing, the way our team was playing, um, I, I, it's there's no way the Rangers would have beat us. I mean, we lost we lost in six games. I think game six was like two nothing there. There's just no way we lose that series to the Rangers. It's not happening. Um, you know, LA had a great team, and and you know, say what you want, they were playing really well too. But the Rangers gave them all they could handle in the finals. So I just try, I just, I just don't see them beating us. Um, so I, I, I totally regret that, man. That was, that was just, uh, what an unfortunate situation, right? There's, there's always, uh, you know, I, I respect him as a guy, Chris Kreider, but I absolutely hate him as a player. So that was, I'll, just, I'll never get over that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, also in 2014, uh, in the second round, you faced off against the Boston Bruins. You know, Boston Montreal, huge rival, probably the best, you know, rival in sports. You beat them in seven games, but there's another storyline going on. It was you and Milan Lucic just going at it. Um, how did that start, and what did he say to you in that handshake line? Yeah, we. Uh... Man, we just started battling all series. Um, I think it was kind of like our, our whole team had them so wound up. Like, they had a tough team, man. He, him, Sean Thornton, Adam McQuaid, um, uh, what's his, Kevin Miller, um, who else? Is, man, they had they had a really tough team. They, I mean, again, like in fight, he was there. He plays hard, he's a big body. Like, they had a really tough team, and they tried to bully us. And they just wanted us to fight the whole time. And I think where they were getting so mad because nobody would fight them. Like, you know, we, we would keep hitting them. We'd stand in their face. We'd push them back. But we just wouldn't fight them. We wouldn't give in to their fights. And, uh, like, every single game. And, and you know, I scored in game three. And I, I was, you know, our line was playing well. And, and I think, you know, we were stirring Sean Thornton up. He was so wound up. Uh, every single game, like in warm up, I would just stand there and look at him, and he would just lose it. He would be so fucking angry. He's screaming at me, screaming at me. I was just laughing. I'm like, man, what are you so angry about? Relax. Like, <laughs> have another Red Bull, bro. Relax. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Lucic wasn't scoring in the series. Either. I don't, I mean, he might have, he scored in game two, I think, in the empty net. Might have been his only goal of the series. And that's when he did the chest pounding thing. And I just, man, I just, I hated it. It was like, you're scoring on an empty net. You know, you're in the playoffs. You're going to pound your chest down the whole ice. Like, I just thought it was so disrespectful, man. All the things they were doing um, are just little things that, like, everybody talks about stuff that you don't do. You know, they like bulletin board material, everybody calls it. Like, that's that's the stuff right there. And, um, you know, game five, him and Jerome again, the flexing on the bench. Like, oh, man. And it's it's just it just fired us up. So we, we had him so wound up the whole time. Then I scored in game seven, three minutes in, which really wound them up. And um, and the handshake line, I could see him coming. And I could see the steam coming out of this guy's ear. And I'm like, I can see him chirping some guys up there. And I'm like, he's probably, there's no way he's chirping guys. I've never seen a guy chirp a guy in the line. We're shaking hands. We're coming through. We're coming through. And then he grabs my hand. I'm like, yeah, good series. And I kind of like keep going forward. And he like grabs my hand and like pulls me back. And I'm like, hey, what's it, what's, what is this guy doing here? And he's like, you're fucking dead next year. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you next year. I'm like, okay, like. Are you serious? And he was just man. You could just see the fumes coming out of him. And then he, I don't know, he tripped Amelin too. A couple, a couple people back, and uh, you know, probably something he he regrets at this point for sure. I think. I mean, we haven't talked to this day. I, I think we could have a good laugh at it now. <laughs> uh, right. Over a couple of beers, we'd have a good time. I think. Um, on this, uh, you know, very young Canadians team. Uh, what do you see in the you know in the future with the talent they have, like Suzuki, Caulfield, Romanov? And do you think the those kids will eventually lead the Habs to their twenty fifth cup? Yeah, I think they have some elite elite talent for the first time in in a really long time. Um, that that's homegrown. I know I, I know they traded for Suzuki, but you know how many times in the last twenty years outside of Carey Price and PK Subban have they d- developed a superstar through their system? That just it hasn't happened. Um, so to, to have Suzuki and Caulfield to me, which are, 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 you know, they're right on the cusp of being bonafide superstars. I think they're both going to have huge years. Uh, you know, bodes really, really well. I think they got a lot of good supporting cast around them. Um, I think Romanov's going to be incredible as a defenseman. Uh, I love the way he plays so physical, not afraid to get after guys. He can skate, he can rip it. He sees the ice well. Um, you know, when, when you have, Two elite forwards and and you know a D man like him that that's going to eat up a lot of minutes. I think it's it really really bodes well. But um, 
as for them being Stanley Cup contenders, I I don't know. I don't know if that those are gonna. That's I think it's a tall ask to, to say if they're gonna then lead to the uh, uh, you know twenty fifth cup. I think Carey Price has a couple more good years in him, um, but I I don't know. I don't. Know. Tough to say. They they got to get a, a a pretty good supporting cast over the next couple of years to try to get that twenty fifth cup. You ever consider being a coach in the future? Uh, I didn't till about this year. Um, I I just because I'm just. Like I said, I, I from playing in the NHL, I, I got so tainted on the business of the NHL that I really wanted absolutely no part of it. Um, you know, I, I I just I know the way I looked at some coaches, and I I would never want to put a guy in that situation. There's there's just the things you say to them, you know, and and you know I'm talking about like as a healthy scratch, and you know I know you're bullshitting me, I know you're lying to me, I know I'm not playing because you you know you want to sit me out to play this guy because you're trying to trade him and there's just so many politics. I know you're lying. Just tell me the truth. And then you go home and you know, you overthink it and your life, you become depressed, shit like that. Like, I don't want to put guys through that. And, and you know, that's kind of the reality of being a coach. You got to be okay with that. That's why a lot of coaches are assholes. But um, as I, as, as you know, I've, I've kind of stepped away over the last year and, and kind of when I started Habs tonight, I started to become a fan again where I like, you know, remove myself from the politics and, 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 you know, just kind of enjoy watching the game again, man. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I've had so many different coaches and I've been in so many different locker rooms and rooms. Um, I feel like I would make an incredible coach because to me, like I could have sit there and I've done it a hundred times where I was like, okay, don't trade for this guy. It's not a good mix for our team. You trade for a guy and he doesn't work out. Or, you know, I was like, man, this guy's an unreal player. He just needs to go somewhere else, get an opportunity go somewhere else he plays well um so i just feel like i've been on all aspects of a team i played on the first line i played on the fourth line i kind of know um a lot of the roles i think i would, I would be pretty good at it i don't want to pump my tires too much but um i just i just i think i i also think i'd rather coach junior than pro too i, I think you have more impact on on younger guys and i think it'd be a little more fun uh, I could definitely see myself coaching in junior when I'm when I'm done playing in the next couple of years here. I think uh, that's something definitely I'll dive into. Do you like anticipate like a possible return to the NHL again, or as playing? Yeah. No, no. I I close the door on that one. Um, you know, when when I had tryout offers last year. Uh, sorry, last. Well, sorry, January this year. Years are all meshing together for me. Um, you know, I had a tryout offer in Winnipeg and, and Calgary and a couple other teams and stuff. But in Winnipeg, like I said, we were literally locked down for three months. I couldn't skate. And, and training camps were 10 days. So my agent's like, well, you want to go on this tryout? I'm like, well, I haven't skated in three months, man. You, you can't go to an NHL tryout when you haven't skated in three months and try to make a team in 10 days. I was like, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. Like, forget it. I'm not doing it. Um, so at that point, I kind of made that decision. That was like, okay, I'm done. This is it. I got to kind of move on and get past it. And it Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say if, if COVID doesn't happen and, and things don't change that I don't play another year in the NHL. Um, but to kind of have it, t- you know, and again, if it was a normal year, I could have kept training and skating and then I, I would have taken a trout, no problem. So to have something out of my control, kind of take that, that opportunity away from me, that's kind of, um, you know, something I'm a little bitter about, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, I always knew I was kind of going to go to Europe and play a couple years anyway. So, um, I'm getting over it slowly. Speaking about COVID, um, how is, how is the bubble like in 2020? Because that was just a strange time, you know, because this the season like ended immediately four months ago and you're just thinking, what what the hell is going to happen? Yeah, it was weird. It was really weird, man. We, you know, um, we finished in March and, and I was playing really, really well in March. Um, our, you know, I got called up January 1st, played really, really well. Um, and, and, you know, kind of if COVID doesn't happen, I'm pretty sure I continue to play the rest of the year and probably sign another one year deal. Uh, so, you know, it shuts down in March and then you start thinking, well, you know, is the whole season done? They're not going to start till next fall. Is this it for me? Um, and then, you know, you get called back and, and we're into the bubble, but it was weird. So you had like a month training camp, almost three, yeah, probably three, four weeks. And you couldn't see anybody. Like you come to the rink, you get COVID tested, you walk in, can't really hang out with anybody. The dress rooms are all split up. You have like three guys in your dressing room practice. 
and then you leave and you can't even hang out with anybody away from the ring. So that for three, four weeks was miserable. And then you go into the hotel and you're not even allowed to hang out guys at the hotel. Like we're on our, we're, you know, go to practice. You're not, you, there's not a lot of hanging out, get on the bus, boom, back in your hotel room. That's it. You can't, you know, you go have meals with the guys at dinner, boom, you're done back in the hotel room. So it was, it was miserable, man. I hated it. It was kind of the, the big reason for me why I didn't end up going to Switzerland because I was like, fuck, I was just in prison for two months, man. I can't, I can't go do, you know, more isolation for, for eight months, um, you know, away from my family. So that was, uh, it, it was difficult for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. So, uh, Dale, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, make sure you and your family stay safe during COVID. Uh, I, we all wish you a speedy recovery and just good luck on the season. Appreciate it, boys. Uh, and anytime you guys want me back, I'm I'm happy to do it. All right, thank you. All right, take care, guys. You too. You too. Take care. Everyone, thank you guys for watching this edition of the Tundra Cast. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, your your guys' support. We've been doing this for ten months now, and honestly, if no one was watching this podcast, and hell, if none of the guests were coming on, we wouldn't be here with without you guys today. I know that's cliche, but. It's the, it's the truth. So just thank you guys for supporting us, watching us. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.